you hold the Guinness World Record for being the first human ever to walk the length of the Amazon River. People were giving us death threats as we were walking down this river. We had to walk through the red zone, which is the drugs trafficking area of Peru. The Peruvian consul in um, London said you can't walk through that area. Nat Geo, for example, at one point wanted to um, commission immediately a program where I took red net Americans into tribal areas, but I said no to it. Welcome to the first officially officially named podcast in our series because we've had two before but we didn't know the name to the insights of everything and I'm very pleased to announce that our first guest is um, a man of few words right but he's done a lot in his life it was Mr Ed Stafford hello Ed hi Rob you don't make you need to stop tapping the table do I okay yeah. all right okay sorry do I need to do that again or are we happy with the ta- with the tapping no, it's okay it's funny good okay he's already told me off he's only been here 30 <laughs> seconds in you were in okay that's, well, that's good to know right so uh, I just want to start this by saying that Ed and I do know each other outside of this remit so that may be good for this podcast it may be bad but hopefully it's somewhere in the middle but right Ed so I'm just going to reel off a couple of things here and uh, knowing you as I do hopefully this is going to be a little bit cringy for you right, right so you hold the Guinness World Record for being the first human ever to walk the length of the Amazon River. Still true. correct? Still true. correct. Is this true or false? No, no, it's just correct. Right. Okay, true. Correct. Right. <laughs> you featured on the cover of the Royal Geographical Society's Geographical Magazine. You were Diane Sawyer's ABC News Person of the Week. Don't know when that week was, probably a few years ago. A long now. time ago. You were described by Sir Ranulph Fiennes as being truly extraordinary in the top league of expeditions past and present i'm assuming that was based on your amazon mm. right you were announced as one of the national geographic adventures of the year in 2010 and then in 2000 in march uh, 2000, 2011 in march and you were awarded the european adventure of the year award in a ceremony in stockholm in sweden now i want to know did you go to that ceremony i did yeah you did well they said that i wouldn't get the award if i didn't go oh, um, okay. <laughs> basically yeah, you know one of those outfits that set themselves up. The European Adventure of the Year sounds really grand. It's about two. It's two blokes who decided to do something over a beer in a pub, and they wanted me to be there so that they could boost their award. But they said, if you don't arrive, we'll make somebody else. If you right. don't come, we'll make somebody else European <laughs> Adventure of the Year. <laughs> Brilliant. Brilliant. And also, so um, what have you done since 2011? Why haven't you won? A, why haven't you won any more adventures awards? Because I don't go on expeditions anymore. No. Okay. Fair enough. No. Easy as that. Right, I haven't yep. finished though. Right, so I'll do a little show reel for you. So Ed Stafford, Naked and Marooned, Naked Castaway, bit of a theme going on here. That was the same show, that was just the American title. Okay, fine, okay. Marooned with Ed Stafford, Ed Stafford Into the Unknown, Ed Stafford Left for Dead, Ed Stafford First Man Out, 60 Days on the Streets, 60 Days with the Gypsies, Ed Stafford Man, Woman, Child, Wild. Mm-hmm. Is that right? Is that have I covered most of the shows now? I think so, mate. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Books, sixty days in isolation, naked and marooned, adventures for a lifetime or adventures for a lifetime, Ed Stafford's ultimate adventure guide, expeditions unpacked, epic expeditions, twenty five the greatest voyages into the unknown, and then walking the Amazon. Yeah, so wrote, wrote most of them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> of course, you did. Right. Okay, so any more books? Um, you don't I wasn't know. listening. No. Okay, fair enough. And then you're also a Scout Ambassador, a Wet Wheels Ambassador, not quite sure what that is, and a patron to the CCFA. What's the CCFA? I don't know, mate. It's on your Wikipedia okay. page. So it, it, is, it is something, right? And then the last thing, so you correct me if he's wrong. So this is the funny, boring bit. Instagram followers, 291,000. I wouldn't know. No, you wouldn't know. Twitter, 72,000. Facebook, 240,000. And YouTube, nearly 9,000. Mm. And you only joined in this year, I believe. So you only start YouTube this year? No. No, that, that fact's wrong on Wikipedia, for starters. Okay, so I want to... That was my bit of who is Ed Stafford. Yeah. Good. He can elaborate. Um, Hopefully most of that was true. Most of it was, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Good. yeah you're right. It's a bit cringy, but yeah. So... Uh, I want to ask, what's out of all of those? Then, what's what's been your most uh, proudest moment to date since back, since then? Career-wise, yeah. Um, I think you know, 
in its entirety, walking the length of the Amazon is the thing that I look back on and I'm the most proud of. I think um, none of it was rocket science in terms of I just had to pack my rucksack in the morning, walk an average of seven miles during a day through the rainforest, put up a hammock, wash in a river, and do it again 859 times. Um, but I think um, it was the thing that changed everything for me. I was an ex-military consultant. I was doing sort of bits of bits of work out in Afghanistan and stuff like that, which I didn't really want to do. I don't like that ex-military mercenary circuit. And um, and it was the thing that ma managed to drag me out of it. Basically, I I was quite. I think a lot of people do amazing expeditions like climbers and stuff, but they're quite kind of anti-media. They're almost so purist that they they don't embrace the sort of game that you have to play when you when you put yourself out there in front of the media. And um, I was the opposite. I, from the very beginning, knew that I wanted to create a bit of publicity around this in order to give myself a little bit of a head start. So I um, organized like professional photographers to come in so that you'd get sort of glossy photos. I had an, an amazing lady uh, called Vicky who did the publicity for the expedition. So to actually have a publicist um, for an expedition like that happened, made a massive difference. Like when we came back, I think there was, we did a, a, an evaluation of all the column inches and, it, uh, and if you were to pay for them as adverts I don't know how that particularly works but it was 25 million pounds worth of advertising inches in terms of the column inches we were we were given um, so she did a phenomenal job and I, I always knew that even though I, I kind of wanted to live this life um, you just keep tapping no, sorry, stuff I know, but the TV was about to turn off <laughs> in turn I guess I guess I knew it, although I wanted to do the expedition for purist I wanted to live this uh, sort of almost romantic um, life where I'm just putting up my hammock in a different place every single night and washing in the streams and meeting amazing indigenous people. I always kind of knew that I also, if I was, if I had a rubber stamp of being the first man to walk the length of the Amazon, that that would help me from a career perspective. And, and it did. It was, um, I think, that, that whole notion of getting a Guinness World Record or doing something that no one's ever done before, for me, it changed things. Massively, yeah. Mm. And with, so, on the on the expedition, were, were they all the people that helped you? Were they new to their market, so to speak, and keen, or were you were they well established people that you knew would help you? Because obviously, you, you I mean, you were new to that world, I suppose, at that point, mm -hmm. and we're using utilizing this the, the the platform of walking the Amazon as your vehicle to the next stage. Yeah. Were you able to get the experience you needed for that, or were you reliant on people like you said? I think. It was Kirsty, I think you know, Vicky. Vicky, for example, was she just really good at her job, or was she new? Was she keen? You know. Yeah, I mean, she sort of described her Vicky Rimmer. She was called, and she um, sadly we fell out uh, <laughs> after the uh, expedition, um, and don't talk anymore. But she was amazing. <laughs> she uh, she said, I, I'm, "I'm always going to do a bit. A a client will be pro bono." And she thought we'd be walking for a year, and we ended up walking for two and a half years. Um, but she did a phenomenal job. She was kind of guerrilla PR, you know. She yeah. she got us, you know, on ABC News and um, and CNN. Um, no, it was actually um, who was it? The Diane Sawyer show. Yeah. Somebody had us on for ten days in a row, basically doing live interviews at the side of the road. Um, and I believe the show transmitted to two hundred and forty international territories globally. So you're live tv to 240 territories every day for 10 days like the the value yeah. of that is just yeah. extraordinary um so she did a phenomenal yeah, job and I, I think yeah you're right i did have really good people and initially in the career obviously you're asking for favors so the pho first photographer that came in keith um who ended up being an usher at um, my wedding he um he came and gave all his time for free but was a phenomenally talented photographer so you know i think things like being aware of how you look visually when so that if a paper wants to re write an article on you they've got a sort of indiana jones style photo yeah. of you with a machete were you worried swan. about that were you no I, I was trying to create it I, I you know i mean i really i really was you know i'd be the first to admit that i wrote my first wikipedia entry um, myself and i i think it was it's a game that you had to play and 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 i only make a point of this because some people i don't think i did an expedition that's above and beyond what a lot of people do i just think i went about it in a slightly more strategic manner in order to in order to create a career i suppose and when did because i think it was, it was channel four right mm -hmm. so when did they get involved channel the four or well channel four didn't um um transmit walking the amazon channel five and um discovery channel did right sorry so it was a, it was a co-commission um 
No, um, I filmed all, all, everything for two and a half years without a TV commission. So it was only when we got back that um, Chris Evans's old company, uh, Ginger TV, yeah. um, they'd given us cameras and they gave us uh, the, the tape stock uh, to film it on and, uh, and half a day's training on Stretton, Com Stretton Common. And um, they cut it together into a little sizzle yeah. video, put it to the broadcasters and... And yeah, amazingly, it got commissioned. But if it, had, it was a bit of a punt, you know, when you're filming for two and a half years, not knowing that it's actually going to make TV. And mm -hmm. you know, my wife's been through this more recently. Laura, she's for, um, you know, kayaked down the length of the Essequibo River, did a three-month expedition, filmed it all. No one's remotely interested. So it is, it is a bit of a lottery, I suppose. Yeah, and then and then also mentions that you went, you started the. Tell me if this is right or wrong, but you started the expedition with a friend. Yep. Called Luke. Yep. Are you still friends? <laughs> no, because um, he didn't finish it with you, right? I'm he no, he didn't. I mean, that, okay, that's the thing that probably is still the biggest regret of the whole expedition. I think um, depends how deep you want to go, but I think we both had strains, financial strains. Weirdly, an expedition like that is quite expensive to get off the ground. Um, people were giving us death threats as we were walking down this river um, you know the, it was quite a dangerous area we had to walk through the red zone which is the drugs trafficking area of Peru so I think at the time two-thirds of the world's cocaine was grown in this area and the, I remember the, the Peruvian ambassador in or the Peruvian consul in um, London said you can't walk through that area it's far too lawless um, um, but we did and um, and I think it, it, it had strains and, and I think hmm don't want to slope shoulders too much but I think many people do this when you get when you're stressed you end up taking it out on the person in front of you mm -hmm. like marriages the, you know we had a chat about this earlier like sometimes if you haven't dealt with the stresses in a in a in a meaningful manner you end up they end up spilling out and so you end up taking it out on the person that's closest to you and at the time that was Luke and so after about three months he said let Ed I've completely had enough of this and he described it as me sort of battering him down. Right. It was, it was, and I, and I'm not obviously not proud of that. It's um, it's horrible looking back to know that because you were under stress, you took it out on somebody else to the extent that they left an expedition. But I think I did. Um, and you know, I'm, I wrote to him twice. Uh, one when I was writing the book at the end of the expedition, just saying, look, mate, I, I want to tell your backstory so I can do you justice in the book. Um, let's meet for a beer. Um, and he wrote a one-line email saying, uh, I never want to. Uh, speak to you ever again in my life um, and then and then another time about three years later I reached out again hoping that things had just calmed a little bit but he, no he's not he's not interested uh, but I think you know none of us are angels none of us um, get life right perfectly all the time and that's just one of the things that you know I have to look back on and learn from and realize that in stressful situations I have a, a, an ability to project um, uh, onto other people so yeah yeah thank thank you you picked <laughs> you picked the <laughs> rawest I, part well, of that expedition that still to my, this day that wasn't my uh, <clears throat> I didn't mean to do that uh, but it was just only because again it was doing some of the research around it was it was because it was mentioned I actually didn't know that and I suppose most people wouldn't necessarily know that you know you started and out. I don't mind being asked I think you know life is about learning life's about making mistakes and then and then learning from them and if, if I you know I, it, it even applies to marriages you know I I think everyone's lived a difficult past three years, you know, post <coughs> post the pandemic, and I can feel myself doing it, you know, at times to Laura, and and, and you just like don't don't make the same mistake, you know. As long I think as long as you you can learn from things, then then. So it's I suppose worth. doing doing what you did at that point, you know, because I could ask you what was the most <coughs> scariest part. Um, okay. It's yep. probably quite a lot of scary parts, I'd imagine, to compared to us when. Yeah, we're we're walking down a high street in Leicester is scary versus you know walking to the red zone of, uh, of a, a a drug area. But um, I suppose I imagine it made you uh, before you had you had certain uh, perceptions of what it was going to be like walking the the Amazon. Yeah. Did it did it match them and <laughs> and more? I'm assuming probably because you you would have had experienced stuff you've never experienced before, never even maybe <coughs> imagined experience before. With and the same with the with the Luke thing, right? <clears throat> I think um, weirdly I think young people have the ability to throw them into throw themselves into things I was 33 at the time so relatively young throw themselves into things that they don't necessarily have the, all the answers to and, yeah. you, and, and, and 
it was reckless the expedition um you know i think we knew what i did know yeah i've been I, I wasn't completely naive i'd been in the military i'd reached the rank of captain i'd come out and i'd you know i'd led expeditions for a number of years since doing this like gap year expeditions taking kids into the jungle and stuff so i had a fair degree of experience but i think i recognized as well the more we micro planned it the more uh, we were just wasting our time really uh, at the end of the day i just said to myself every day have at the end of every day when i got into my hammock have we moved forward and if the answer was yes then that was a successful hopefully day seven miles long hopefully seven miles well yeah it was it was an average of seven miles a day i mean it, no it was no, it ab- we actually average. That was what I was hoping to average. I think we averaged four miles a day in the end. But is that why? So we, we had you planned it's a year or two, or did you not just say right? I'm going to walk it, and it's as long as it takes me. Okay, so yeah, the length of the river is three hundred and the length of the river is four thousand miles, and and I thought I divided four thousand by three hundred sixty-five yeah. days, and I came up with eleven miles a day, and I thought I could walk eleven miles a day. That's easy, um, but it's not like the so Grand Union nice, Canal with a little towpath going yeah, down the side yeah, of it. Yeah, You've yeah. got flooded forest or vase air, as, as it's called. And so half the time, you're not even walking on hard ground. You're walking through floods and, you know, you've, there isn't a path. There isn't an opening. So you've got race grass and thorns and branches and stuff all in front of you. And so half the time, you're cutting with your yeah. chetty underwater, which is just, it just feels nonsensical. Um, you know, anyone who was traveling through that area would go by boat. Yeah. But we'd set up this non <laughs> nonsense expedition aim of walking the whole thing so so we had to we had to walk um, had to walk it but that's why it took a long time yeah, yeah. I, I mean i remember sitting down and watching it right i remember as, it. as a as a youngster um you know <laughs> w- watching it um and thinking it, it was pretty it was pretty amazing right as this thing I, I hadn't seen anything like that before right you mm. obviously we'd watched david attenborough and, and such like mm. you know, from a mainstream perspective but i think this is um you know so, something something new and it maybe even well, it wasn't around. I wasn't aware of the other adventures around the world. But if, we, if I ask you before, you talked about your career before Amazon. So what? Yeah. I, I wanted to keen to ask you to who your heroes are. Cause I kind of know who one of them is anyway. But w- 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 did that have an influence on you making that change to go from doing what you're doing in the army, for example, to I think I, I want to do this because a hero of mine has done something like that, and that gave you that extra motivation or. Um, I don't know whether it was really it, it, I mean it's multiple layers of reasons why you end up going doing something like that I think um, the thing that physically sparked it all off was um, I don't know whether you remember Bruce Parry he was um, he, he, he had a BBC series called Tribe he'd go into remote tribes and yeah, 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 yeah. take hallucinogenic oh, drugs and wear a yes. penis cord and yes. all that sort of stuff and um, he, his aim was to be one of the tribe we when I was leading expeditions, gap year expeditions, he was a leader. Um, actually, before I start started leading for this company called Trek Force, um, he was a leader. And when I started being a leader, none of us who were leaders had any jungle experience. I'd been in the military, but I'd never been into the jungle before. So they shipped Bruce back in, and he did a week's training with us. And he was so charismatic; it was amazing. But um, I remember him sitting by the campfire and just said, "Look." if you want to enter this world, because he had on paper what I thought was the most dream career of, you know, being on TV, going to cool places, meeting amazing people, soaking up different cultures. And I just thought this is fantastic. He said, you need to do something no one's no one's done before. So he, he was, in terms of walking the length of the Amazon, that's where that spark started. I think from a psychological perspective, I knew it was going to be tough and I knew that every day wasn't going to be fun and you know putting on wet clothes every morning getting beaten by mosquitoes and ants and all of that sort of stuff is is a kind of prison sentence once you've committed to it but I think I always knew that that was going to be the case and I think if you were to really go deep and ask why I would put myself through something like that for two and a half years I think it came down to a kind of insecurity Um, and this I always have to quantify this. Or I feel obliged to quantify this if I talk about it. It's like it isn't a sob story, but I think I was adopted and and I had deep insecurity surrounding being abandoned, being rejected. And I think I did. I, people talk about it a, lo- a lot at the moment, sort of. Um, uh, but it's kind of a post therapy thing. But believing that you're enough, having self esteem, you know, believing that you're a worthy human being. I think I think I, you know, I I hadn't mastered that. I didn't. 
I was I was definitely insecure and I think doing something like walking the Amazon was for me a way of proving myself to myself and to the world you know that I was capable that I was a, um, a an able human being that I wasn't only capable of living a normal life but was able to do something that no one had ever done before and I think that probably reflects how insecure I was if I'm honest and I think I do think I, I see that a lot of explorers or adventurers whatever you want to call them um, kind of beat their chest and say yeah I'm doing this to highlight the effects of climate change or I'm doing this and I think you know, nobody really does these things for these sort of um, for these sort of charitable reasons I don't think I think you've always got a little personal reason deep down and I, I see a lot of them and I think I think it's very similar they're, they're in that they, they haven't they've got something to prove you know they, 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 they're flawed characters and, and I think if you if you were to be married to Ronald Fiennes I'm sure he's not listening to this podcast because he can't even work a computer but if you were to be married to Ronald <laughs> Fiennes he um, you know I bet he'd be very difficult I bet he'd be a difficult human being to, yeah. to live alongside. Um, not that he's not outstanding at, at putting up with and enduring hardship. He is utterly the world's leading person do you think, for that. Do you that. think that, that in that space, that's his most comfortable space to be in, potentially, rather than the home life? Yeah, weirdly. I think people do seek out or resonate. <laughs> there are certain characters that seek out that sort of challenge the whole time. And you talk, you see... I've, we went to the Millies Award, which was hosted by the Sun newspaper, the, the military awards, yeah. and I was sat next to this guy who w was in the SAS, and he'd come back from Af Afghanistan, and he described to me the only way that he could he could get the same buzz, really, of, of, of battle was to get on his motorbike at 2 in the morning and drive the wrong way down the dual carriageway where he lived down in Devon um, to get the same sort of thrill level. And I think, weirdly... <laughs> I don't know wh whether it's a trauma thing. You know, you, you hear stories of, mm. of, of, of women who've been beaten then going and, and attracting a partner that is the same, you know, and, and, and sort of self-perpetuating yeah. situations. And, uh, and I, th I think maybe that seeking, not pain, but, you know, a sort of difficult life where you've got to overcome obstacles um, attracts a certain type of person, mm. I guess. So... Do you, do you feel that you do you compete with other, with other adventurers or <coughs> ah. do you feel that you do or not? I think people are lovely actually in general. People are really lovely. Um, Bear Grylls, for example, it'd be very easy. You, the, in our industry, nobody goes away filming without having the bear conversation and he just seems to be one of these people people like talking about like Boris Johnson. Um, and a lot of people are negative, but I have to say, um, I think it, a lot of that stems from jealousy. You know, he's, risen to the level of taking Barack Obama on a on a sort of uh, you know filming adventure thing uh, he's done phenomenally well um, and he's been very supportive and kind to me I mean he <laughs> this is a very name droppy story but it's nice because it shows his his level of kindness like he w my wife Laura and I were at a party in London a bit of a pretentious can I say wanky on this podcast mm -hmm. a bit of a wanky party uh, full of posh people in Knightsbridge and um I got called away to do a little photo thing and Laura was left with Bear and when I came back about 20 minutes later he was still he hadn't made excuses and gone off and yeah. he, he was still talking to Laura and she then subsequently met him about three months later after her expedition and he'd remembered all of the, her answers and asked mm. her all the right questions and stuff and I think he's quite a genuine guy and um, and yet there are other people that I've I have for some reason felt more competitive with and, and you do I think there is a human tendency to compare yourself with other people. I think it's, you know, it probably comes from some sort of survival mentality of needing to, you know, be tough enough to um, to win the woman of the tribe or to be seen as more virile than anyone else. And I think I think you have to step aside from that. I certainly got quite competitive mentally with Leveson Wood when he um, went onto the scene and started doing Channel Four programs. I think he because he'd. <laughs> I did an expedition called Walking the Amazon, he did an expedition called Walking the Nile, which was a fairly similar title. I'd actually registered that domain name myself when I came back from the Amazon. And then he walked the Himalayas and stuff, and I found myself comparing myself to him and being a little bit envious because I was on Discovery Channel, which is a satellite channel, and he was on Channel 4. Mm. Um, and you do consciously have to stop having these little mental battles where you're comparing yourself and just, just go, well, if somebody's... If somebody's taken what you've done and 
and launched a career off the back of it that, let's face it, doesn't hurt you at all. It's a compliment at the end of the day. It's like uh, imitation is a compliment, isn't it? And so I've, you know, but I think... Well, walking the Amazon probably helped him walk the Nile. Right. Well, I think well, his original website, I was credited for giving him the inspiration, but that fell off <laughs> as soon as right. he got a, a <laughs> Channel 4 career. And the, and the thing is, I'm not anti um, Leverson Wood. We, we're all, um, I think everyone has the ability to slip into these, these very easy default comparative states. You know, it's just yeah. human nature, isn't it? But, I think, but equally, it's good to be aware of it and try and step away from it so that you, you can be more supportive. Yeah. And that's why I suppose I, I, I was really pleasantly surprised by Bear, who could easily think, who's this young upstart who's now making survival programs mm. on Discovery Channel? He yeah. could easily have been an idiot to me, but he wasn't. He was so yeah. lovely all the way along. So you, you've also yeah. got a link, though, because don't, don't both of you are sort of ambassadors for the Scout movement and everything else. Yeah. So you, sort of, you, do, you do other things together, which I think is is often lost when you, often when boys become a certain age, they forget about the Cubs and the Scouts and, and the Beavers. I think we're both probably generations that we all were one of those, yeah. maybe, right? Um, so, but, so that's nice. So, well, I, was, I was listening to you then, and I think because <coughs> of what you've done and what you do, and, and uh, you know, the Bear Grylls of this world, they've become you're you're a bit more than just a name. You're a business, right? So a lot of what you said, you can actually relate something to a business because we get envious of our competitors and, and what they do and what they do, you know, and how why are they doing it now because they may have seen us on our website or we've done this. So it relates a little bit, somewhere in, in mm-hmm. some way or form, even though the the actual what you're doing is completely completely separate but I think you know what we're keen to maybe move on to rather than talk about the Amazon forever forever and more is, <laughs> is, is around because you mentioned how oh, clearly this was the trigger right in your career yeah or the step change in your career and you know one of my thoughts is you know would is the, the question what would you do now no what you need what you know now what would you have changed but that's it's hindsight is a wonderful thing but I'd love to know how you found it coming back from the Amazon, and then the Ed Stafford name became a brand for one of them. Yeah. And then how you maintain, how you, how you look to maintain that, or what, what sort of avenue you went down with it with your name, rather than okay, I'm going to sell my soul to the devil, and I'm going to go on every single program I get invited to, versus actually this is what I want to be. Because yeah. again, you know, it does relate a little bit to what, to what we do um, in some form or another, but. I, I'm, I'm interested in the stories behind it. But I think I think you're right in saying it is a brand, and 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 I was unequivocally trying to create that plan, but that brand from you know publishers to photographers to um, um, to Wikipedia pages. You know, I, I, I was trying to create that myth, and it is a myth. But 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 I knew that if you were, oh, he's who? Where if a for example a broadcaster was commissioning a program, who's Ed Stafford? Oh, he's the guy that walked the Amazon bang you've got a calling card you've got yeah. a, a tagline so to speak um and hopefully it's, it's gone beyond that now in terms of the survival stuff that i've done in the channel Four documentary stuff but i think yeah you have to be a bit careful you know i wouldn't partner with marlboro or whatever um and you know especially being a scouts ambassador as well you know you you have to project a certain image online but i tr- i do try to be super honest i, I don't I certainly don't think exploration or being an adventurer or being a survivalist on TV is about being perfect. I mean, I think almost my, if I was to have a USP in terms of self-filming, it's, it's making mistakes. It's, it's, it's not being afraid to film the stuff which has just gone completely tits up and, 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 and that people probably are laughing at you for doing. Um, and I, actually, I think certainly with the survival world, because I, let's make this very clear, I was not a survival expert when I first did the 60 days on a island I just I'd had to employ bushcraft teachers to teach me how to light a fire I was you know I'd walk in the Amazon I'd just do a lighter the whole time um but I think weirdly that helped me because rather than if Ray Mears had been dropped on an island for two months he would have just you know cut about lit a fire got some food right that's that's interesting isn't it well done Ray mm-hmm. and um I think the thing that was potentially interesting was that I didn't have enough skill to get it right first time and I was making loads of failures which is probably more like the viewer would have it, it had the, had the people who are watching had the same experience it's probably more similar to them because I wasn't an expert and then I kind of I, I suppose evolved into being a very heart on sleeve self filmer and I, I enjoyed doing that but yeah you're right it is it is a brand and and um, I'm, I'm quite aware of that and and it's weird when a brand is you as well um, do you find it, it difficult to talk about you outside of you did 
the thing is, I think other people, not that I've got everything right, but I think one thing I did get right was in creating a brand where you're not perfect. In creating a brand where you mess things up the whole time, you don't have a pedestal as much to fall off. I think there are certain people out there who set themselves up, certainly as a Fail. television brand. Well, they set themselves up as too perfect. perfect yeah. And I think then you, you, you're you asking for the papers to have a dig at you or yeah. to you know to find out that you're having an affair or something when you're projecting this squeaky clean yeah. image. I think, not that I'm saying that if I have an affair, I'll be fine, but I probably <laughs> won't, and I'm not planning to. <laughs> but I think, I think weirdly, I'm less uncomfortable about talking about myself as a brand because I'm just being me. Um, and I, I, if I'm not being me, I've just, I've messed up. And I, I try, I try as much as possible to, what, what you see is what you get. And, um, and, and, when, that, go sorry, on. when, when has that, when has that fallen, has that fallen flat on your face any time? Because you, you're hoping for this and it I guess. because you, you didn't conform or something like that. Um, yeah, I mean, okay, so the, there's only been two of my series that have aired in the US. Um, um, the original Maroon series and um, First Man Out. And they were both rather humblingly pulled after two episodes. So not enough people watched them, so they actually pulled the series off air mid-series. Um, and I think, you know, that slightly self-deprecating British way of going about things or, uh, or, 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 or honesty really just didn't resonate with the American market so I, I think in that respect yes that it has bitten me um, in the arse because because not being the sort of action man that gets things right which would resonate far better in the American market has, has, has meant that I've never broken that market and therefore I'm you know I'm not as big a name as as other people um, so I, you know it, but then again I, do I did you want to play that game? Yeah, but that, that's the thing, you see. I'm, at the moment, I'm at a really nice position where I can go away and do, make cool TV programmes that I'm invested in, that I enjoy, but I can still go to the pub with you at the weekend and not get molested, whereas if I made it in the US, suddenly you explode. Your whole yeah. life changes. Mm -hmm. um, so you, so you, you think, probably, you know, and you've got a young family as well, so there's that self-conscious -ness around you that go, actually, if I did do this, it, it's not just me that it's affecting, it's everybody in my life that it may affect. Yeah, I mean... Take, taking the example of, you know, we can go to the pub together, no problem, right? Yeah. But I think, well, it would, if it you would, weren't, you'd be, you'd be mobbed. I think it's it's not that I've <laughs> deliberately tried to fail so that I could go to the pub. No, I don't mean that. <laughs> no, no but I mean that, that sort of unconscious, unconscious bias within you, because you talked about it earlier, about, you know, wanting to be a certain way and truthful and, and non-perfect yeah. often means that you are not... Uh, as adventurous, by the way, out there in the world, so you don't get that fame, right? You're not, uh, you don't come across to me as a guy who seeks fame. You'd rather, you know, fame may come your way because of what you do, and you do a really good job, but you do it in an honest way. And if fame comes, brilliant. If not, that's okay. Yeah, I think, I think it's even though that I think you're right. I think it's still, you still have to step aside from when your ego takes over, and you think, oh yeah, I could do that, and I'll, you know. The, you get wooed, you get flattered by certain things, and, and unfortunately, the world of TV is very good at blowing hot air up talent, as they call people on screen, yeah. up their bums. Um, and I think it's what Jerry, the cameraman, calls me at times. <laughs> talent, yeah. <laughs> I call you talent as well, Rob. You're a very <laughs> talented human being. I think, so. I think, yeah, you have to you have to recognise where you're probably making the wrong decision because your ego has taken over. Um, yeah, I. I Nat Geo, for example, at one point flew me over to the States um, business class and took me to their head office and wanted to um, commission immediately a program where I took redneck Americans into tribal areas for a weekend um, so that they could have a little epiphany about life. And on the face of it, this is, you know, it's made by an American production company, a chance to make it in America. And I, had, and I was massively flattered by the fact that they'd flown me out there full stop, you know, and the, the head of Nat Geo at the time was prepared to, to give you know an hour of his time for me and, and then say yeah we'll make this show um, but I said no to it because I recognised that a show is so much harder to be the true version of yourself if you've got an American production team around you and if you're not inherently 
hey, if you haven't bought into the concept of the show as well, it's like, are we really going to make well. meaningful epiphanies yeah. in the lives of these? And, yes. and, and, and are the tribal people going to be treated well? Or are they, yeah. is this just going to be this entourage of, of um, camera people dropping in on this community, causing chaos? And, you know, even if they're paid well, that in itself, as I've had first-hand experience of, can cause huge problems for indigenous tribes yeah. if they've suddenly got this influx of cash. Um, a lot of it, you know, I mean, I'm digressing but slightly, but it could be spent on alcohol, it could cause huge yeah. chaos. Um, but, that, but I think that's what you've, <coughs> how you've come across so far, and we've been chatting about is, is that you could have easily gone the other way and not necessarily cared about what you're doing or where you're doing it or who you're doing it with, but you did make that decision that I do care about all those elements. Yeah. For what you've, like what you've just said, because it is actually important to you that what you produce is, is is good engaging in fun and but also good for you and I don't mean that in a personal way I mean it, you know well being well, of you as well I think the personal side comes into it doesn't it because I mean I think we all certainly sometimes have jobs that we have to take because we've got to pay the bills and you know not every decision I've made has been utterly purist and I've not been able to say no to certain things which I might not think are exactly what I would want to be doing but you know you've got kids mouths to feed yeah. and, and you've got bills to pay and so yeah you can only ever try to lean in a certain yeah. direction yeah. and so we'll lean on a bit talking about that is around you know it'd be it's interesting just your thought no, no, not your thoughts on covid because that's a separate topic is obviously that's probably a tricky time for anyone who's a freelancer who works in tv so now i can't go anywhere i can't do anything yeah um you know wh how did you feel like you needed to adapt into from that perspective of what you film filming wise but also utilizing the assets of social media etc you were probably able to diversify a little bit. Um, well, we did. <laughs> Again, I've got quite a few answers going through my head when you asked that. I mean, okay. I remember us ones. both <laughs> embracing COVID in a very different way. I remember <laughs> meeting you on a dog walk <laughs> and, and literally you came up to me about to give me a hug and I was like, yeah. Rob, stay away from me. <laughs> and I remember initially COVID struck and I was like, this is this is the survival scenario that I was born for, you know, and I started, you know, detailing every item that came through the letterbox and everything like that. Um, and then, and then that, that wore off quite quickly. I, I think, yeah, work did stop. It was squeaky bum time financially. We, everyone, like many people, we had bills to pay and, and no money coming in. Um, we ended up trying to diversify by launching a couple of things. I launched a podcast, which did six episodes and, 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 and didn't have enough viewers basically to justify itself. I also, with a mate of mine who was a cameraman and another mate who was a bushcraft expert, we set up these, um, well, they were meant to be masterclasses in, in, in um, bushcraft. Um, and we invested, a, I don't know, a fair bit of money, about eight to 10 grand each in, into making this, um, these masterclasses in fire lighting and, and, um, and um, use of axes and wilderness cooking yeah. and stuff and, and nobody bought them at all um, we <laughs> completely messed up from a sort of marketing perspective and I think for me it was quite humbling because also made me realise and just because my name's on it doesn't mean that everyone's going to buy a fire lighting course for 9.99. that's mm. a series of videos when they can get them all for free on YouTube um, but it it made me realise the value of the broadcaster as well. And, yeah. and, and whereas before I might have been quite flippant about my sort of slightly derogatory comments about Discovery Channel, it made me realise that, that that is a relationship that I would not want to um, mess with because mm -hmm. that it's, a, it's a platform that allows me to be who I am on it and, and, and be seen by lots of people and therefore, you know, earn a living from it. So, yeah. Okay, good. And then, so, yeah. now we're out of... <coughs> Thank you for outing me about my COVID scenario. Um, <laughs> uh, although you're, you're more of a relaxed, yeah, more sorry, of a relaxed reception well, we, to the rules. Yes, you were. <laughs> we, we, were, we were in our one one hour a day or one walk a day scenario, and we were in the, the countryside, I suppose, yeah. is, with fresh air. So we were sitting at the window taking notes of how many walks you were having a day. You were, not really. <laughs> uh, you might have been. Like, I was sticking to the rules. Uh, yeah, just, sure just that were. one hour took about ten hours, maybe. Um, so now, now we're sort of out of that remit. It's interesting because I know you, some of those, pro some of those um, elements you've got, you've licensed your name a lot, right? Mm. I think is that true in saying that you've licensed? Yeah, I mean, there's a. Have you constantly done that because because of you don't you're quite happy to let the Ed Stafford brand not be controlled because you've got an element of it, but a lot of the stuff that you've had over time, lives, etc. You've quite happy for someone else to run it because it's not you know it's time not time for you to step back, but maybe refocus. I think. 
like a professional rugby player, a professional football player, there's a window of opportunity of being an adventurer on Discovery Channel. You know, I'm 47 years old now. At 55, will I be running down mountains with my grey hair and my, you know, uh, receding hairline and stuff? Um, possibly not. And I think, again, like, I'm using sportsmen as an example because it's relatable, but I think it was just a recognition. This is going to stop at some point. Should you set up businesses that that complement what you're doing now, but that will have more longevity, and, and that's why we went down the licensing brand and uh, licensing route. And I think um, in most of it, <laughs> luckily, most of the success has been in China. Um, in in terms of, I've got a, again, it's fortune really, but my programs resonated very well with Chinese people, and and therefore um, I've got sort of eight million social media followers out out in China. Take about ten million now, I think, on Kuaishou and Daoying and and um, What's the other one? I can't remember. Weibo. 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 Anyway, can't even pronounce it. Um, <laughs> but they... Um, Weibo. Um, but I think that helps, doesn't it? I mean, you, I mean, if, if, you, if, you, if there is a self-consciousness surrounding your, your, yourself being a brand, if it's not in your own country, then, then, then your mates take the mickey out of you a bit less for it. Um, I think that certainly the partnerships I've done in the UK, I've only, I've only picked people who, who are who I believe in, yeah. like um, I've, I've had relationships with Land Rover, but you know I, 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 I love that I love I love that brand. I love those vehicles. I've had relationships with Vivo Barefoot. But I'm into you know barefoot mm -hmm. running. Um, the knife maker that makes that makes my sort of line of knives is such a lovely man, Ben Orford, and him and his wife Lois. They they've got this little hub just outside Hereford, which is this craft making workshop and they're just beautiful people that love going hill walking and he makes the best knives in the UK so I've partnered with somebody who's 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 making things that are like minded to you though in, in terms yeah of and so yeah it, it, it's not suddenly um, going mass market on something that doesn't resonate with me and my brand and mm -hmm. and, and I suppose my brand is just my morals I guess and, and what I think well, is uh, the uh, right it sounds like it right in, in, yeah. because you met you know half about bit earlier you made that conscious decision to to do that because you didn't want to like i said sell yourself sell yourself because you could have done that right yeah you know the noise that must have come your way after walking the hours and it must have had you know people saying ed come and do this come and do that come and do this come and do that I'll not as much as you think <laughs> no. oh, okay well i dream that that sort of thing oh, hopefully that would have happened but okay, and, and flouting numbers that would have probably made you stand up and think oh okay, this is this could be the life for me but actually the real the when reality hit Obviously, it wasn't like that. So then, I'm not saying you had to go through that cycle in order to get to where you are, but you, before you, you go, actually, I don't, that's not me, that's not Ed. Therefore, mm. me as a brand, I want to do it this way. And whether you whether you actually made that, you know, looked yourself in the mirror and went, I'm going to make that decision, you've made that decision through actions anyway. So it was, it was part of your subconscious, I think. Yeah, well, I guess if we're acknowledging that I created a brand, it's a surefire way to destroy it by linking with something that doesn't that doesn't come especially that, now in this world because you go wow well, yeah exactly i mean if i was i don't know on a chewing gum advert on the back of a bus yeah. or something like that what what is he doing doing yeah. that you know you might, do, you it see. may have been a good payday exactly the ramifications of it yeah and i think it's the long game isn't it in that respect um and you have to be careful not to go for the big books just for the sake of just for the sake of immediacy paying yeah. the bills and stuff yeah. and saying that right, right. Talking about and listening to what you said, so if China is the next step, yeah, could that all be flipped on its head because it's all in China and you haven't got to worry about being back here? Could you be a bit more, you know? Yeah, no, uh, and and yes. or should you be right? If you're saying you're not, you know, you, you might be running down the hills with you know your little lad, for example, because he might he might want to be his dad in a few years' time, and knowing him, he probably will will want to be right. So that might be slightly different, but. Does China give you the opportunity to rewrite your brand in a way that maybe you wouldn't have done on your doorstep, but because it's over there, I can, and I can milk it, for want of a better word. Um, I think there is an element of that, yeah. I mean, there's weirdly, there's two cuts of the shows that I make on Discovery. There's a Mandarin cut and there's an international cut, and the Mandarin cut has a lot more sort of weird and wonderful eats, and it's focused on the you know things that um, the China market um, prefer. Um, and in terms of the social media, yeah, I've got I've got a, a friend out there called Teddy who runs all the social media and stuff, and and I'm making him content all the time. And yes, we're doing it because there's a there's a, there's a strategy. 
he, for example, has the Teddy Bizarrely is an outdoor person, probably the leading one in, in, in China at the moment, and he has a knife that outsells Bear Grylls' knife in China. And you may I offer one single knife, he, he makes about 40 grand a month. And, and um, yeah, there's, there's a huge, there's a huge um, market which loves buying stuff, um, and there's an opportunity there. Um, so, is China playing I don't think, models? no, I don't, well, no, I'm not, exa- I'm not selling. I'm not selling drugs to kids on the street or anything. I'm selling bushcraft knives and rain jackets and tents and stuff like that. You know, at the end of the day, you're still facilitating people going outdoors. And I, that's the thing that I suppose if there were to be a, um, a sort of philanthropical side to what I do with the scouts and, 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 and stuff like that, it's, it's like all of my success has come through having adventures and going outdoors and taking risks. Um, and so encouraging people to do the same thing through, I don't know, a rain jacket, which mm-hmm. doesn't cost too much, but it, but it will help you be outside and less it's uncomfortable. It's a very nice rain jacket. I have, I have Thanks very much. Nice. <laughs> I can, I can, I'm happy to model it. Um, I'm well, that'd be, out, yeah. well, you're not wearing it now, are you? No, no, no. It's a bit too warm yeah, for that. Is. For many things. <laughs> I, um, I don't know, mate. No, I think I, none of... I wouldn't, even though... No one in England's gonna see the stuff that, that ends up getting in China. I wouldn't I wouldn't do stuff that um that is completely off brand. I just think that there is a great opportunity there and you know, it's really tricky in terms of attitudes towards China and stuff. But um certainly every time I've been out there, everyone I've met has been um, been so friendly and hospitable and you know, of of course there were you know, that I think the the Tory government under trust declared that China was deemed to be a high level threat now to the UK I mean yes I did hear that um, today I think I heard that yeah I mean it, it, it's nuts but I think it's all too easy to think oh therefore China bad yeah you know yeah. the rest of the world good and that's yeah. obviously not the case at all it's you know people making decisions up at governmental level does not mean that the average person on the street isn't an amazing person and, yeah. and really kind and, and 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 all the rest of it so no I, I like working with China I like I like the opportunity that it presents it's quite exciting yeah you can become you can just turn on your business head I suppose yeah, yeah. well, well I th- that's that's because it's not, all I'm hearing from you is you forget all the China and all the others but it's it's a new market for you it's mm. an exciting market for you yeah um you know like you say you're, you're not you're not doing bad things you're just selling tents and jackets yeah, it's just yeah. into, and the, the market is, a, is massive which is why it's exciting for you. it's very much like us when we when we launch into the usa market because we know the market in the us and that is you know 20 times bigger than the uk market so the excitement's there now the hard work is actually fulfilling that market and actually getting a slice of it and, and i suppose you over the next 10 years will, will try and maximize that market as much as possible through either being there more often doing yeah. more tv over there or, or expanding your range of products to yeah. a degree right I think I think so. Yeah, I mean, it is, again, I know that this. Uh, I know that you will understand this. I, I think my reasons for doing everything have altered over the year. As a young, twenty-something-year-old adult, it's it's ego. It's banging your chest. It's wanting to prove that you're a success in the world, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And especially when you get married and you have kids, it's about providing for the family. That you you're. You become less selfish, I think, as you get older, don't you? And um, you try, well, and, you and, try to. And, you know. Well, you or you try yeah. to, and yeah, you need to keep a bit of time for yourself to go sane, to stay sane if you can. Um, mm. And you probably give t- too much time to family and work, mm. and ignore your mates at your own detriment. But yeah. on the whole, you no, I it. <laughs> <laughs> but on the whole, um, I think. You know, you could some. You could say, "Oh, you're selling out to China." I, I think no. I'm I'm providing. Not, I'm providing I'm for providing that. for yeah, my yeah. family. I yeah. don't hear. No, yeah. I don't hear that because I don't, I don't yeah. think you've ever done that because you could have done it in several times. Yeah. I think that's the, say the, the point I was trying to make post the Amazon war. You, you could have you could have done the red net thing. You yeah. could, of course, you could have done yeah. right, and then that probably would have led to an, an other thing and another thing and another thing, and suddenly yeah. you're ten years into your career and think, "Have I ever actually done anything meaningful?" That are you know that. That, yeah, that ha- that sort of touches my core. Or, or you could have done that, right? I'm, yeah. I'm so, well, I that my point was that China is a, a, a new vehicle for you, a new market. Yeah, and I was just getting at would you because of what you learned over the last fourteen, fifteen years of doing it your way. Are you just going to continue doing it your way, which it sounds like you are, just maybe to a bigger market, or would you change a few things because you've got a new opportunity in that market? Hmm. I end up doing 
more wacky, bizarre stuff, for example. What, it's like the, the, the Kishi Castle and all that we used to see on Channel yeah. 4 there? For the Chinese market, mm. that I wouldn't put out on social media in the UK. But it, So yes, I, I adapt myself in order to please the market. Um, and, and, you know, eat, eat stupid things and, and, and stuff like that, because that's what's called for. But again, you know, it's, it's not morally unsound. No. You're, just, you're just playing a part, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, that, and, and that's all I hear. I'm not, yeah, I'm, not, yeah, this yeah. Is no, I'm just thinking, do, do we need to call ITV and Anton Deck and get a, uh, <laughs> an I'm a celebrity, you know, bushcraft adventurer version and see how you all cut it in the, uh, the Australian or Welsh hills, whichever, whichever it might, might be. That sounds quite, that could be good TV, yeah. Thanks. You can have that one. Thanks, you can man. have that idea. But no, I, I'm, I'm excited for you with, with, with John. I think it could be great, you know, knowing you and your, your family who are amazing people. It could be a wonderful thing for you. Um, and um, I'm more than happy to go to the pub any time you like, by the way. Right? <laughs> even for no, a I'm not drink, or, or not a drinking at the moment. Even for a, a Coca-Cola. <clears throat> but uh, the, this is my last sort of bit, because I know we, we've, we've chatted about most bits. But the last bit is, knowing, knowing you pretty well over the last few years, um, what would you hope for the ki your kids, right? Because I know, I know Laura's got her thing and she's got lots of things. You know, for the kids, would you want them to do something like you? Or do you think actually a nine to five might be better for them in the future? Or are you just going to let them be who they want to be? Oh, I mean, you kind of answered the question. Yeah, I know. Yeah. But um, I think, you know, a anything from the outside, I think, looks more more sort of um, Instagram filtered than it really is you know there's, there's a lot of instability to being freelance as, as anyone who's freelance know and, and, and you know I don't have a contract with Discovery that renews every single year every every idea every series is, 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 a, is a sort of deal that has mm. to be won I suppose and you have to pitch for it and then you have to get it and there's this huge relief but there's a difference in the time between series and suddenly the money that you put aside to get you to the next series suddenly you're not filming for another six months or so or in covid even longer so i think there's an instability there so i wouldn't necessarily go become an adventure around it you'll sort all your worries out because it certainly won't that said if they want to go that way then great ran house said recently that he well he, he said he wants to be a number of things but everything from a fireman to a to an explorer if he wants to do it amazing i think i think it has been kind to me in in, in many respects and it's allowed me to to grow as a person. I think I would hope that they wouldn't do something just for the sake of money. I'd hope that they wouldn't do a menial nine to five thing that they found soulless. I'd hope that they go after something that really resonated with them and that made them feel satisfied. I think that's one of the key things in life, isn't it? It's a feeling that you're valued or feeling that what you're doing has purpose to it. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think you did answer it, you know, as long as they are happy and they are being who they are, then, I, then I'm happy too. Yeah. So no, nothing is, uh, you know, because a lot of people that have been successful in a certain thing would would never want, that, never wish it on their kids at all, right? Because, but again, let's go back to. You've only let's say you've only ever done things because you morally think they're right. So you started off on the right foot. So you may not have had those experiences necessarily, right? Yeah, I mean, but I wouldn't want I wouldn't want it to be that you know. Well, we're having this little epiphany in life at the moment because you know we were lucky enough to have bought a nice house in a nice village. And as you know, because I grumble about it from time to time, the you know the list of jobs that I've got to do, or the or the bill, the, the the money that you have to provide to to pay the bills at the end of the month is is bigger than average. And you know, it's it's all too easy to think when I'm when I'm rich, <laughs> or when I've got a big house, or when I've got a flat Land Rover, I'll be happy. And then these things happen, and you realise actually it wasn't it was almost a fabricated society induced dream of or false um, false idea concept of what will make you happy in life and I think and I think I'm certainly reevaluating stuff at the moment Laura and I are planning to take the kids off as you know in, in April next year and go and live in Costa Rica um, it's not just for the sunshine and and and, and um, the change it's also to sort of experiment with a would we be happier with less concept? And you know, certainly the place that we've hired or rented for the first month has got no air conditioning. It's not even got walls on it. Actually, it's got mos mosquito nets that you look straight out into the jungle. It's 300 meters from the beach, and I just, 
I want I do want to experiment whether we need all these extra trappings in life and or whether they actually just add add to this sort of mouse wheel or hamster wheel that you're on that the more stuff you have the more you have to earn you've got to pay for it the more stress you've got the more frenetic life is the less time you've got and I think actually that's probably the biggest one um, is is wanting a lifestyle where I've got more time so when I've got a bit of time off rather than tackling the list of jobs that I've got to do I can say to Rand you want to go and surf you know and, and actually enjoy Sounds enjoy like your time off yeah. so so yeah but, but think, you're also not doing it with camera, cameramen following you around are you? It's, it's, it's just for you and your family isn't it well, well it taints things I think yeah. and, and, and yes we, de we definitely um, as soon as I said I was going to move to um, Costa Rica my agent said that would make a brilliant TV program yeah, and um, and yeah we, we just we, we yeah, again we're tempted for a day or two yeah, and then when do you know what this is gonna it's not the main reason why you're doing it it's it? gonna just you know i could imagine ran for example who's going to go to he's five years old at the moment he's going to go to a costa rican school and it will be a spanish-speaking school and for the first month or two he's he's going to be struggling you know because he's, he's in a new language and i can see the tv cameras they want to point them yeah. at ran at the end of day one in floods of tears devastated because he's got no mates and he can't understand the teachers you know that's gold dust for them, yeah. and you don't want to invite that into this sort of yeah. experience. That yeah. is that is sort of selling yourself. That would be selling out. Yeah, 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 absolutely. yeah it would. We don't really. Also, just just for the record, though, I won't be coming to see you unless you've got walls and, <laughs> and air conditioning. Mosquito nets, very. Uh, I'm sure, but thick I and yeah, I can't wait to bring yeah uh, <laughs> my wife and kids out to to that environment. But um, all right, look, well, look, Ed, I really appreciate your time. Thank you very much no for sure. coming on and having a chat with us. I, did some of it. I knew you'd be insightful and, and honest, which is uh, <laughs> why we brought you on it. But um, yeah, thank you very much. Pleasure.